All right, so um, Friday I'm planning to spend on review, but are there any questions? Because we don't have to wait till Friday to talk about stuff. Um, yeah. There was a question on the return of that you said. That was uh, messed up slightly here. You said there was going to be a revised version of that question. Yeah, what was the question? Do you remember? I remember it was. Uh, what did they ask? Mm -hmm. It was converted or gave away too much information. I can go back and look at it. Let's see. I think it was the last question. Oh, yeah. So I gave you a hint that was actually, like, not a good hint. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I hate when that happens. Yeah, so there'll probably be a modular arithmetic question, um, or a Fermat's level theorem question, but something related to exponentiation using modular systems. The problem on this one was was um, what I wanted you to do. So um, prove that six to the n minus one is a multiple of five. Well, if you just do straight modular arithmetic, six is congruent to one, so six to the n is congruent to one to the n. So, which is just 1, so 6 to the n minus 1 is congruent to 0, which means it's a multiple of 5. But for some reason, after I wrote this, I went back to it the next day, and I thought, that's kind of subtle. I should also give you a hint on the other way to do it, which is to break it into cases, but you can't break that into cases. Right? We don't have cases for exponents. So my hint actually was gibberish. So I won't have a gibberish hint on the final. All right, well, um, so let's keep going with Turing machines. So we started off with, with um, an introduction to Turing machines. And I said that you can think of it basically as, as um, this system with an infinite tape and some kind of read-write head. And we have this tape broken into pieces. And we can write a symbol at each location, and we can read the symbol that's underneath the head, and we can modify it. And there's a series of states. And so our machine basically looks like a state table, which says, if you're in a present state, and there's some symbol, then go to a new state, write a new symbol, and move, and we're going to move the head left or right. So present state and symbol means we should write a new symbol, move to a new state, and transition the head one direction or the other. That's the whole state table of this, this machine. And so let's just do some examples. So I'll show you a state table. I'll tell you what some of these things mean. I'm kind of curious what this machine does now that I'm writing it.
text. This means if we're in state S0 and there's a symbol under the head, we should change to state S1. We should replace that symbol with a 1. We should move to the right. If, there's, if we're in S0 and there's a 1, we should go to S1, write a 0, and move to the right. If we're in S0 and there's a blank, so by default this tape is filled with blanks initially. I'm just going to use a B for a blank. So... If there's a blank, then we should go to state S2. We should replace the blank with a zero and move to the right, and so on. And the convention is if at some point you move into a state <coughs> that does not exist, the machine halts. So any of these transitions that try to move to S2, since there's no state S2, the machine will halt at that point. Otherwise, it goes into that state, and then it begins at the beginning of the table and tries to find an entry that matches the current state and the current symbol. If it doesn't find an entry that matches the current state or the current symbol, it halts. Okay, or if it tries to go to a state that doesn't exist, it will halt. So suppose our tape originally contains a bunch of blanks followed by a zero, zero, one, one, and then a bunch of blanks. And suppose that we're originally sitting right on top of this leftmost zero. So let's see what this machine does. And we're, we're starting off in S0, so S0 is our initial state. So you've got to know the initial state contents of the tape and where you're sitting on the tape to begin with, and you have to know the state table. Okay, so we just go through from the beginning until we find an entry that matches our current state, and there should be at most one such entry. So we're in state S0, and there's a 0 under our head, so that's this first entry, S00. So this means we should go to state S1. We should replace that 0 with a 1, and we should move to the right. So we've updated one symbol on the tape, we've moved to the right, and our state is now S1. So it was S0, not S1. And now we start from the top. We're in state S1 and we have a 0. Bang, 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 that's this entry right here. So if we're in state S1 and there's a 0, we should go to state S2, replace that entry with a 1, and move to the left. So we come back to pointing here, and our current state is now S2. And state S2 with a 1 underneath, we look through here, there's no entry for state S2, the machine halts. So all it's done is replace those two zeros with a pair of 1s, and the head is back where it was originally. That's what the machine did to this input string. So it's not terribly exciting, but that's, that's what it does. I suppose it started off sitting on top of this 1. So we're in S0 and we have a 1, that's this state right here. That says change this to a 0. Move to state S1, move to the right. And state S1 with a 1 says um, stay in state S1, replace this with a 0 move to the right. Now we're in state 1 with a blank. State 1 with a blank says go to state 2, replace this with a 0, move to the left, and state 2 doesn't exist so the machine halts. So in this case it replaced the two ones and a blank with three zeros and it ended up one spot to the right. Why? Don't know. It's a random example. But we can do non-random things with state machines like this. So, so this is a recurring theme in this chapter, right? With 
phrase structure grammars with, with state machines that we looked at on Monday, um, and now with Turing machines. We can do some analysis, and the more we analyze these machines, the more we'll start to understand how to synthesize, how to design, say, a Turing machine state table to do certain things. And if you do this enough, you start to develop methodologies for building blocks, right? I mean, this is how we program in C. Um, take someone who's never done anything on a computer and ask them to make a reservation program. They got no idea how to do it, right? But when you know the building blocks of a bash script and you understand how to use Zenity and you know how to pull variables out with back quotes and all this kind of stuff, you can start putting those together. It's exactly the same process with Turing machines um, or state diagrams or automata. So let's try to do something purposeful. Um, let's um, let's toggle um, the rightmost zero. So for example, if your input string looks like like this, we want to change it into this. We want to toggle that rightmost zero bit. So if we were to think about the things that we believe a Turing machine can do based on one example so far, um, we can move left and right and we can detect symbols underneath the read right head and so we're going to have blanks on both sides. So just kind of in words, what sorts of things could I do to get to the rightmost bit in this number? Let's just say we're starting somewhere in the middle of the number, but we don't know exactly where. Take the place in the current symbol with itself and moving right until you reach a block. Sounds good. So let's just start looking at the current symbol, replace it with itself so it doesn't change anything, and move to the right until we get to a blank. When we get to a blank, if we move to the left, we know we're sitting on top of the rightmost bit. So we can put comments in our Turing machine. All right, let's find first blank. So we'll start in state zero. That's usually a good starting state. So we're in state zero, and we have a zero. Let's go to state zero. Let's write a zero, and let's move to the right. If we're in state 0 and there's a 1, we'll stay in state 0, we'll write a 1, and we'll move to the right. Well, that accomplishes the first part of what you said. It's replacing symbols with themselves, but moving to the right. Until we find a blank. So now we're going to change state to record that information. We're going to leave the blank in place, but we're going to move to the left. So now, when we get to state S1, we're pointing at the least significant bit. <coughs> All right, well, we want to find the first zero as we move to the left. Kind of the same thing as trying to find a blank when we move to the right. So let's find the zero. So if we're in S1 and there's a 1, we'll stay in S1, we'll write a 1, and we'll move to the left. If we're in S1 and there's a 0, what do we want to do? Go to S2, replace it with a 1. Go to S2, replace it with a 1. I don't think it matters which way we move. And if we don't define the state S2, the machine will halt at this point, And we'll be sitting exactly one spot to the left of that bit that we just changed. You got to have a direction of movement, yeah. It's kind of unfortunate, but we can we can live with it. And if we have it set up the way we do now, there aren't any zeros, we'll just run to another blank and call. 
if there aren't any zeros, it will eventually run into a blank, and there'll be no state S1 comma blank, and the system will halt. Or we could be explicit and say if we're in S1 and we have a blank, let's go to S2, write a blank, and I don't know, move some way. But we don't really need that. So there's a machine for toggling the rightmost zero. All right, so let's keep going with this. So here's an 8-bit binary number. If we complement it, we get this. If we add 1, we get this. That's the 2's complement of our original number, right? And if our original number was something like this, and we complement it and we add 1, we get this. So there's a shortcut we can use for finding 2's complement. You may have already done this, which is start from the right and go out until you get to your first 1 and keep everything exactly the same. And then keep moving, but complement each of your bits. So in this case, we started from the right up through the first 1. We kept that the same and then we complemented all the remaining bits. So can we make a Turing machine to find a two's complement of an integer? Pretty straightforward. So that's what we had before, so this moves to the rightmost bit. So now we're sitting here. And we've got to do two things. We've got two states we can be in. The first state is when we're moving to the left and we're looking for that first one. So S2, if there's a zero, then we're not going to change it. We're going to stay in S2, we're going to write a zero, and we're just going to keep moving to the left. That's working over these things. If we're in S2 and there's a 1, we're going to leave that bit intact, and we're still going to move to the left, but now we're going to change state to record the fact, to remember the fact that we've encountered our first 1. And S3 is the state where we complement. So if we're in S3 and there's a 0, stay in S3 but write a 1. And if we're in S3 and there's a 1, stay in S3 but write a 0. And again, as we keep moving, eventually we'll get to another blank. There'll be no S3 blank. Our machine will halt. And we've taken a tape that had an integer value on it, and we've replaced it with the two's complement of that integer value. So we just did some arithmetic with a Turing machine. And it's absolutely a different way to think about things, but it's fairly comfortable once you do this enough. So, can you have an infinite amount of states, or is there a limit? No, so it's a finite state machine still. Mm -hmm. But the tape is infinite. Okay. So, that can go on. But yeah, it's got to be a finite state table. So, you can find simulators for this. I don't know if I have a network connection. I may not. Yeah, this is a problem. It'll come out of it. Um, so we can find simulators for touring machines online. It's not a bad exercise to write a touring machine simulator. 
it's a pretty simple system, right? I mean, you have to know what your state is and what your current symbol is. Your tape can just be a big array, and your head position is just an index. So you look at your state, which is an integer probably, or maybe a short string, and you just have an array of these state transitions, right? Um, and each time that you go to the top of your loop, you just look at your state and your symbol, and you find an entry that matches it, update your state, change the contents of your tape array, and increment or decrement your index. It's a pretty straightforward simulation. I think people have contests to see what the shortest touring machine emulator is they can make, and I'm pretty sure people have it down to one line in some languages. Um, so here's a touring machine simulator. Um, so this, this checks an input string to see if it's a palindrome, so it's a 121 assignment um, done as a state machine. And it's not too long of a program. So they've, they've got some shorthands in here. They've got some wild cards and things like that, but it's, it's convertible into a pure touring machine. So we can start stepping the simulation. So there's our original input tape. There's the read right head, um, and this is a palindrome. So you can see each state that's executing, and it basically is moving left and right and gobbling up characters and depending on whether it gobbles a zero or a one it does this in a different state where it's expecting the same character and then when it runs out of characters it tells you that you got a palindrome whereas if you start off with something that's not a palindrome And there's a bunch of examples in here, so you can do binary addition. So here we're going to add two numbers together, and we can start running that. And it becomes a question of using temporary symbols to record information on your tape. But that's not bad. That was pretty quick. It's almost as fast as my old laptop. We can do multiplication. And so it's counting how many steps it's taking on the right, and it's showing us the current state on the left. Um, and this will take a little longer. And it's part of why it's a weird way to think is because you're trying to manipulate this information on the tape, but the tape is also where your memory is. And so you need to sort of work around the data that you're manipulating with the temporary storage. But we do this in computers anyway, right? We don't have five different memories. We have one memory that we store everything in, including the program. And we just kind of work around it. Well, we're up to 750 steps so far. So um, let's go ahead and run this at full speed. OK, so nine, oh, I was almost done, 980 steps. But if we pick some bigger numbers. So there's a couple of 8-bit numbers, and let's run that at full speed. So it's not bad background in a cafe, it makes people stop and talk to you. So 5,000 steps. And it might look kind of horrifying, but I mean, this goes on in a conventional computer, right? If you have a computer like a PIC processor and all it's got is like add and subtract and maybe an integer multiply, and you try to multiply big numbers, you got to break it down into little pieces. How about prime number testing? So let's see if 5 is a prime. <laughs> hey, it's prime. Let's see if 31 is a prime. I don't 
know how long this takes. I don't think it's more than a minute or two. <laughs> but it's probably interesting to watch. <coughs> he probably missed that. All right, so what's it doing? It's just dividing by consecutive odd numbers, hopefully. But division on a drawing machine is fairly complex. Certainly more complex than multiplication. And you notice they didn't put any comments in their program, so we don't actually know what it's doing at these different steps. And this program, oh, they put comments in the beginning. OK, I'll give them points for that. This is very inefficient and slow. <laughs> Should not happen if input is valid. In the syntax directions, down below it says that you can use a star to tell it to not move. Oh, OK, cool. And I'm pretty sure that's equivalent to a system where you have to move. So this is 224 lines of, of Turing machine states. Um, it's not actually 600 states. They're breaking them into groups. But again, right, if you were to look at your PA4 in machine language, it's, you know, tens of thousands of bits of information and someone might come in and say, oh, how could you possibly write that? Well, you do it in pieces and you do it at different levels of the hierarchy. So there we go, 31 is prime. It only took 45,837 steps <laughs> to calculate that. I heard that uh, very beginning generations of the personal computer is using the paper tapes, right? So early computers did use paper tapes um, as a way to do larger storage, permanent storage. Um, and it was it was just you know thin piece of paper, and usually I think it was six bit Bordeaux, so it was six holes up and down. Depending on the pattern, you could code different pieces of information. Um, and then there were like holes along the side, like with an old film strip, so a sprocket would turn it and move it one position left or right. Um, it was not you know set up like a touring machine, but similar idea of a paper tape. Um, but paper tapes were cool because they were permanent, right? Most computer memory, when you turn off the power, the program goes away. Um, paper tapes, you could actually punch up the program on a machine, and then you'd feed it into a tape reader, and it would load up memory in sequential locations based on what was on the tape. And so bootstrapping meant toggling in a small program, maybe 10 or 15 instructions, through a front panel set of switches whose purpose was to read in information from a tape and then you'd feed in the tape that had the bootstrap loader and that would be a bigger program whose purpose was to read in more information from the tape and you would use that to read in the beginning of the operating system you sort of go through different levels like that until you got your whole operating system up and running and you can load in your compiler and then feed in your program and it'll compile it right and computers do this today but it's all done internally, but that's why it takes a minute for your machine to boot up, because there's this whole hierarchy of, of steps taking place. There's, uh, it's not a computer tape reader. Let's find a classic one. There's a classic one. <laughs> the arrow telling you which direction the tape goes. <laughs> All right, so um, it turns out that with a touring machine, you can do anything that you can do on a conventional computer, right? So this notion of touring complete means that your computer is as good as a touring machine. So when you come up with a new architecture like a quantum computer, People always want to know, is it Turing complete? Can I do anything that this machine can do? It's kind of the gold standard, because if you can do it on this, you can do it on a PC and vice versa, right? It's a universal computational engine. Um, and they were studied by Alan Turing. And again, it wasn't that he was trying to make a web browser or Steam or something like that. He was trying to study algorithms. 
who's trying to study decision problems and this question of whether or not um, every problem can be solved basically with an algorithm. So we talked about Hilbert's Grand Hotel way back in the beginning of this, right? So David Hilbert, one of the questions he posed at the beginning of the 1900s was this decision problem. And it was, it was a question of basically, can every problem be solved? And to study this notion of solving a problem, coming up with a series of steps that lead you to a solution, there needed to be a formal model of what an algorithm's implementation is. So this is where the idea for a Turing machine was developed. Um, and he studied this question and eventually it was discovered the answer was no, you cannot solve all problems. There are a great many problems that are unsolvable with this kind of notion of, of running algorithms. Um, and I'll give you the classic one and then we'll go ahead and, and play with Turing machines on the board. Um, but here's a classic question, it's called the halting problem. And the question the halting problem asks is very simple. Given the source code for a program, tell me if this program ever finishes running or not. Because you know, some programs have infinite loops inside them, they run until you interrupt them. And some programs have natural ending points where something happens and they get to an answer and they print it out and then the program exits. There's a return from the main program. And so the question is, for example, if you had a C program, can you take the text file of that C program, feed it into your analyzer and have the analyzer say, okay, this program eventually exits or this program runs forever. And it has to know if your program takes input from the outside world, it has to know what the input to that program is going to be. So you give your program two things, source code for your C program and the set of inputs that you're going to supply. And it does some kind of analysis and it has to, in some finite amount of time, give you an answer. And say the program eventually exits or the program never exits. Okay. Now it can take a billion years to get to the answer, that would still be considered a solution to this problem. But it can't take forever. Otherwise your program could simply simulate the program being analyzed and if the simulator eventually gets to a point where the program being simulated stops, it can say, hey, your program's going to stop eventually. But if it's never going to stop, it's never going to give you an answer because it's just going to keep simulating the program. So it's got to give you an answer in some finite amount of time. And it might be, you know, very long for some programs, but as long as it will definitively give you an answer. So that's the halting problem. Can you write a program that analyzes other programs and tells you whether or not they eventually exit? This is always when the flute music starts. <laughs> and the disturbing answer that was discovered in the 30s is that no, you cannot do this. You cannot write a program that, that will do this analysis. And personally, I disagree with the proof as I understand it. And I don't understand the full proof. The full proof is, is the subject of books. Um, and I have some of them in my office if you're curious. But I'll give you the watered down proof that's usually done in computer science courses. Um, and this proof I can definitely blow holes in. Um, but I don't know if that blows a hole in the halting problem. Um, but here's, here's the watered down proof. So. Um, Here's my program. So here's my program. And you feed it um, C code and input. OK. So here's my program, which will solve the halting problem. So first I do some stuff. And some dot, dot, dot. And then at some point, I say, aha, the program halts. So I print, it halts, and I exit. And somewhere there's some other stuff I do, and at that point, somewhere I say, oh, 
it runs forever. So I print out that message. It runs forever. And I exit. And I probably got some functions because I'm doing modular code because I've taken 224. And there's the end of my program. All right, so um, so there's there's an outline for my solution. Yes? If they radiate it, um, it will never reach the uh, infinite amount of time, time statement. Well, I'm, I'm claiming that this program will. It will it will get to one of these print statements in some finite amount of time. That would mean that it will be a finite solution. Yeah, yeah. So I'm claiming that this is a solution to the halting problem. And I'm going to show you why this can't exist. Okay, so this is a proof by contradiction that there's no solution to the halting problem. So I'm claiming that I have a solution to the halting problem. This is what the code looks like. And we're going to see that this code cannot work the way I say it does. Okay, so my claim is that if I give it some source code and some input, it will do some stuff and eventually it'll either print out it halts or it'll print out it runs forever. And it will be the correct answer that it gives me, right? And it's in some finite amount of time. And then it exits. So here's what you do. You run the program on itself. And that's legal. And so it's going to analyze itself and tell you whether or not this program eventually exits. Well, it should come back if it's really a correct version of the halting problem solution, it should eventually come back and say it halts, right? Because either one of these print statements should, you know, exit after it prints it, and I'm telling you that this finishes in a finite amount of time. So if I run this on itself, it should correctly come back and tell me, yeah, this program will eventually exit, right? No matter what program I run it on. Okay, so now I'm going to make a slightly different version of the program. I'm going to call it my program 2 and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to put an infinite number of print statements right after this print where it says it halts. I'm going to print out ha ha forever. And I'm going to leave this the same after it says it runs forever. I'm going to have it exit. And now I'm going to ask my original program to analyze this modified program. And if this works correctly, it should analyze my program correctly. So now I'm going to take my modified program and have it analyze itself. And suddenly I've got a problem. So in a finite amount of time, my program's either going to say my program 2 halts or my program 2 runs forever. Well, if it tells me that my program 2 halts, it means it got to this line of code, which means the next thing it's going to do is go into this infinite while loop. And in fact, my program two is not going to halt, it's going to run forever. So if it comes to this conclusion, it's made a mistake. And if it comes to this conclusion and says, my program two is gonna run forever, the next thing it does is return from main and it halts, and again, it came to the wrong conclusion. And so if I claim that my program 2 does the correct solution to the halting problem, I can show that there's a contradiction when I run it on itself. And the contradiction means that there must be an error in my original assumption, which was that my program would solve the halting problem. And so that's the classic proof that there is no such solution. And like I say, I don't agree with it because if my program solves the halting problem, I don't believe that this, my program too, necessarily solves the halting problem. Because I can write a program where simply adding something like this will mess up what's happening up here. But I wrote that up in a formal paper and I submitted it and the reviews came back and they said this person clearly doesn't understand mathematics or logical proofs. So, <laughs> so I tried. Um, but I've got a paper online if you want to read the details of it. I can give you a pointer to it. Um, 
But the generally accepted convention is that there is no solution to the halting problem. And it's very unlikely that the halting problem is solvable, even if this proof has some issues with it. Because think what you could do with a halting problem solver. So we talked about Goldbach's conjecture. which says that every even number can be written as a sum of two primes. Do you remember that? So 8 is 5 plus 3, 10 is 5 plus 5, 12 is 5 plus 7, 14 is 7 plus 7, or 3 plus 11, and so on. And Goldbach's conjecture claims that every even number can be written as a sum of two primes. Every even number bigger than 2. Well, we could write a C program to test this. Right? Just keep finding each consecutive even number and try to write it as a sum of two primes. I do this for 215 sometimes for one of their programming assignments. Um, so just keep trying to, did we do this? No, okay. Um, just keep taking each even number and generate primes up to half that number and subtract from your even number and see if the difference is prime. And if it is, then you can write that number. And if you get through all your primes and you can't write a sum that adds up to this, and then you know that Goldbach's conjecture is false. Well, put this in a C program, and as soon as it finds a counterexample, have the program exit. Now run this through your magic halting problem program and say, does this program ever exit? And if it comes back and says yes, that proves that there's a counterexample somewhere. And if it comes back and says no, this program will run forever, that proves that every even number can be written as a sum of two primes. And so this halting problem thing will become this giant hammer. You can swing at all kinds of problems. Anything that you can put into a yes-no question and throw into a C program and have it halt if the answer is yes and don't halt if the answer is no, give it to your Oracle, this halting machine program, and say, does it halt? Right? So that's very unlikely that that's possible because <laughs> it, would, it would be just this, this really weird kind of, of uh, Oracle, right? But... Um, but it might annoy you to think that we can't write a program like that. It certainly annoyed me when I first encountered it. Because, I mean, C is not that complex of a language, right? And we can look at a statement of C and we understand what it does. And we can teach a computer what it does in some sense. And you can start following through a C program and pretty easily tell, oh, this is going to loop forever. Or, you know, I is incrementing. Eventually, it'll be 25 and this for loop will exit and then we'll return. Right? You and I seem to be able to do this, so why can't we get a computer to do it? And it's, it's usually disturbing to me when there's something that I feel like I can do and I can't teach a computer to do it. <laughs> well, I think the difference is this program requires 100% certainty. Yeah. And when you go through, you don't have 500% certainty unless you find an obvious point at which way it's like, okay, it was infinity. So, so therefore, you have a high certainty. So if that's true, does the impossibility of finding a solution to the halting problem mean that we can never have 100% certainty when we analyze our code? Well, you can't have 100% certainty for every program that you analyze. That's kind of a cool consequence. <laughs> but, like, I mean, you could, like, theoretically write a program that would go, okay, it spots a lot of easy ones, but there's going to be something that's true. So yeah. So we could get smarter and smarter, but there's an upper bound. Yeah, you can't get smart. Which is kind of interesting, <laughs> I think. Mm. Yeah, so so um, so the classic Turing test is about artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think Alan Turing and contemporaries came up with this idea when they were thinking about AI of, of you put someone in a room and there's either a person or a computer on the other side and you try to carry on a conversation and the question is can the person tell that they're talking to a computer versus a real person? And the theory was that when you get to the point where they can't tell it's a computer, then a computer has achieved intelligence. And we're way beyond that point now, right? I get telemarketing calls sometimes. I honestly cannot tell if it's a person or a computer. Well, until you respond and they ignore you. 
Yeah, yeah. How good Google has been for Yeah. I mean, I've, I've asked some of these people, are you a computer? And they're like, they tell me no, but not in a way that convinces me. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, no, I'm a customer service representative here to ensure your best experience. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, are you a person reading a script or are you a computer or is it the same thing? Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the Turing test that I'm familiar with. Um, but yeah, this gets into some interesting philosophical puzzles. Um, so this kind of, of proof that we can't have something that solves a halting problem. This is an example of something called the diagonalization argument. And I don't think we talked about this when we went over set theory, but we got some time. Let's talk about this. This is not on the exam, by the way. <laughs> um, but this is something you should see. Um, we talked about cardinality, right? We talked about cardinality of, of the integers or the natural numbers. And I made the claim that the reals have somehow a bigger cardinality, right? That, that we can find a one-to-one -one mapping between all integers and positive integers, or positive integers and prime numbers, right? We can have a first prime, second prime, third prime, and so on, or even numbers and all integers, right? So all of those things have the same cardinality because we can find this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence. And we even did this for rational numbers and integers, because we made that table of of rational numbers and we found a way that we could go through it in some kind of order and so we said okay well the integer 1 maps to this, the integer 2 maps to this, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so on and we established a one-to-one -one correspondence between integers and rationals and said therefore these have the same cardinality but I made this claim that if we take the integers and we take the reals we can't find a one-to-one -one correspondence between them and that's what makes this thing have fundamentally bigger cardinality but we never proved that but it's a really easy proof to do and it's another diagonalization argument so let me run through that really quickly just to show you what diagonalization looks like in this more pure form. So claim F is a one-to-one -one map between the integers and the reals. Okay, so we claim that, that these have the same cardinality, which means there's a one-to-one -one map between them, and we're going to find a contradiction. And once we have a contradiction, we'll have to conclude there is no one-to-one -one map between the integers and the reals, and so there's somehow fundamentally more reals. It has a bigger cardinality. So how in the world do we prove that we can't find a one-to-one -one mapping between integers and reals? Well, it's actually pretty easy. We make a table that shows, and I'll, I'll just pick on positive integers, all right? I don't even care about the negatives. We'll, we'll show what one, two, three, four, five, all these positive integers map to in terms of real numbers. And we can just work with, you know, real numbers between zero and one. We don't even need to do the whole set of real numbers. We'll make it even easier on ourselves. So let's suppose that f of one maps to this number. And f of 2 maps to this weird number. And f of 3 maps to pi minus 3. And f of 4 maps to, I don't know, let's just map it to a half because I'm getting tired of writing digits. And f of 5 is... Um, some other weird number, right? But there's some map here that you claim gives me a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a new real number as follows. So I'll leave the zero alone. The first digit is going to be the first digit of f of one plus one. 
So I'm going to take this 2, I'm going to add 1, I'm going to put a 3 right here. The second digit will be the second digit of f of 2 plus 1. So I'll take that 0 and I'll add 1, gives me a 1. The third digit will be the third digit of f of 3 plus 1. And if the digit is a 9, I'll add 1, I'll replace it with a 0, right? The fourth digit will be the fourth digit of f of 4 plus 1. The fifth digit will be the fifth digit of f of 5 plus 1, and so on. Everybody agrees this number I've written at the bottom is a real number between 0 and 1, right? So the question is, what integer maps to that real number? I've claimed that every real number corresponds to some integer under this map f. And you're shaking your head no. <laughs> Why is that? You're going to have a one to one map between your third integer and then the zero point of, never mind, the fourth integer and zero point five, which is greater than zero point three. So, um, well, these aren't necessarily sequential. I mean, they're not necessarily ordered. Right, they could be all over the place. Like 2, 5 is bigger than 0.1. That's okay. So suppose you claim f of n is equal to this number. I can prove that that's not true. Why? Because the nth digit of this number is f of n's nth digit plus 1. That's how I made this number. So this digit d has got to be equal to the nth digit of f of n, which is d, plus 1. That's not possible. Right, so by construction, I created a number which cannot be f of any integer. So this does not correspond to any integer, and so my claim is false. And it's this, this going along the diagonal for which we call this a diagonalization process. And it's just sort of like lining things up just right and then throwing in one little twist at just the right spot that makes the whole proof crumble down. And that's what we're doing with this, this halting problem question. We're taking our code and then we're just throwing in that infinite loop after we say the program halts and we're throwing in an exit after it says the program runs forever. And it, it forces the claim to fall apart. So that's a diagonalization argument. Um, this was used by Kurt Gödel in his proof of incompleteness when he proved that every arithmetic system is either incomplete or has contradictions. And he basically took arithmetic statements, logic statements, and related them to products of prime numbers, right? So we turn arithmetic and logic into sets of very big integers, and then he applied a diagonalization argument and showed that there were some arguments that we could not put together, or we would find contradictions. So this is a really powerful technique. It's been around for a long time. Um, and it comes up in the halting problem. All right, we got 20 minutes left. Um, let's take 10 minutes and go on the board. I'm not going to have halt, have touring machines on your final exam, so this is all freebie stuff. Um, but I want you to mess with it anyway. Um, we do. Um,
So see if you can write a program that takes the two leftmost bits and swaps them. I don't know if this is easy or hard. I've never done it. I think it's doable. I think it's doable without too much switch. So blanks on either side and, and two leftmost bits, you want to swap them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we want to use those four states. 
You've got the essential idea here with your S2. If it's a one, you go to state three. If it's a zero, you go to state four. Getting um, the things you mixed up Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been trying to do those uh, bit swapping. So, so they named their states like two one two two or two one two zero one 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 zero, where and you can use things other than just S something. Right? You can give them more meaningful names. Um, but yeah, basically you're using your states to remember whether there was a one or a zero. Like a variable. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Right. So now, but that 
Let's get the full out of the room. Stay tuned. We have a lot of We got a lot of fear on it. Right on the left of the lab. Then they have three here. Once they're in at one, it'll check the left. Right? It's a one that is 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 a one but alternatively, we could go to this path. So, state two, we're going to go to state zero, just going to go to zero. We don't want to do state four, and in that case, it signifies that you have one zero combination, and then you're all swapping the And then we go back to, and it's just another one, and we're going to go to state four, and we're going to go to state four, and we're going to go to state three. So, if we're in state two, we're going to go to zero, and now we're so then we want to go to state five. And we want to be all the And go left. And we want to 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 go left. And the trick that most of you have discovered is, is you need to have memory, right? You need to somehow record information. So you move over to the left, right? So you do your zero, one blank in state zero, whatever your first state is, and you get to where there's a pair of bits x, y. And basically, you can look at this, and if it's a zero, go to one state. If it's a one, go to another state. Right, so maybe zero takes you to um, S10, and a one takes you to S11. Right, and this state means bit X was a zero. This state means <coughs> bit X was a one. And you move to the right, and now you go to one of two states based on what's under your read right head. If it's a zero, you might go to state. Um, Two zero, and if it's a one, you might go to state two one, and and so on, right? And what you're basically doing is you're going to end up in one of four states based on whether what's under here is zero 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 one one zero or one one. And if you're in a state that corresponds to these, you don't have to do anything because swapping those bits won't change the string, so you can just exit. And if you're in this state, right, you can write a 1, move to the left, write a 0. And if you're here, you can write a 0, move to the left, write a 1. That's a very kind of brute force solution to this, right? There's a lot of brute force involved with things at this level. Um, we're not really, like, picking up a bit and moving it around in some way, right? But we can certainly do that. Um, or we can, we can take everything and move it over one spot. And then, and then pick up that last bit and shift it to the other side and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's different ways to go about this. All right, so like I said, I'm not going to put touring machine questions on, um, on the final. Um, but you'll encounter this in a course on automata theory. Um, let me wrap up with got five minutes here to change the world. Let me wrap up with um, non-deterministic Turing machines. So a deterministic Turing machine is this stuff, right? Based on your state and what's under your read right head, there's exactly one new state you're going to go to, and there's something you're going to place under that head, and there's a direction you're going to move. Everything is precisely determined, okay? That's what we've been talking about, is a deterministic touring machine. A non-deterministic touring machine has some wiggle room inside. It's not clear what it's going to do from one step to the next because there's a genie inside. And this genie can make decisions for you. Okay, so it's a computer that has this magic genie inside that likes you and will make decisions for you. Okay, 
If we had a computer with a genie inside, a non-deterministic Turing machine, we could solve problems a lot more efficiently. For example, suppose you want to factor a large number into primes. You could ask the genie, hey, what number should I try dividing by? And the genie would say, oh, divide by blah, 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 blah. And you divide your number by that, and hey, you get an integer out, and you found a factorization for your number, and it took you one operation. Okay, that would be really cool. On the deterministic Turing machine, we don't have the genie. We have to try every possible number and see which one divides it. That takes a long time. So there's this question of polynomial time. And we'll talk about this in CSE 222, but basically, when you double the amount of data in a problem, how does the time it takes to solve the problem change? Well, if it stays constant, that's nirvana, okay? You can make a problem a million times as large, and it takes exactly the same amount of time to solve. That's called order one. If doubling the amount of data doubles the amount of time, that's a linear algorithm, okay? That's order n. If doubling the amount of data quadruples the amount of time and tripling increases the time by 9x, that's an order n squared. If doubling the amount of data increases the time by 2 to the billionth, right, that's an order n to the billionth algorithm. So a polynomial time algorithm is one whose complexity is some polynomial. It could be x to the billionth, but it's still a polynomial. This is considered good. Okay, what's not good is something like n factorial or, um, or n to the n, right? Those are bad. So there's a class of algorithms that we call um, P, which means they can be solved in polynomial time on a regular Turing machine. So sorts, searches, things like that are P. An NP problem is one that can be solved in polynomial time if we have a genie. Classic example, shortest path problem. So you have your cities and you're trying to travel from some starting point to every city and come back to the beginning with the shortest possible path length when you add up all those paths. So here's what you do with your non-deterministic touring machine. You just add up the distances between the cities in some particular order. And you ask the genie, is there a path shorter than this? And the genie will, if there is a shorter path, will say, yes, first go here, and then go there, and then go there, and then go there, and then go there, and you'll find a shorter path. Well, if your original path was a thousand, you've only got to play this game with the genie a thousand times before either you get down to a path length of one, or the genie comes back and says, nope, there's no shorter path. And in this linear amount of time, now you've solved the traveling salesperson problem and found the shortest path. So TS is an NP problem. It's solvable in poly time on a non-deterministic Turing machine. It's not solvable in poly time, as far as we know, on a regular Turing machine. But it turns out if it is, then P is equal to NP. Every problem in this class can actually be in this class as well. And this is why everybody wants to find out if P is equal to NP, because if we solve one of these problems and you find a poly solution for traveling salesperson, every NP problem is solvable in poly time. And that's a whole different world, and that's the million dollar prize and, and the fame and fortune and all that kind of stuff. And so it's not uh, polynomial, non-polynomial, right? It's polynomial on a touring, polynomial on a non-deterministic touring, right? So. Um, so that's what P versus NP is, and you'll bump into PNP all over the place in computer science. You'll get it in automata theory, um, courses on algorithms, and so on. And this smells a little bit like quantum computing also, because quantum computing is kind of the same thing. It's almost like a genie because it's, it's basically calculating every possible solution simultaneously. All right, so, um, so we've got Friday left, and that's it end of discrete structure. So Friday, um, I'm planning to just go through review, but um, study guide is on Canvas. Look at that and bring questions if you have them. Otherwise, we'll just go through topic by topic and talk about what you can expect. And that will do us. All right, so I'll see you next time.